John, I want to know what it's all about. And some of my friends tell me I should really understand metaphysics. So what are the kind of questions that metaphysics asks? How can you array the different questions uh, as categories or as, as problems to attack? I think uh, one thing that's important to get straight about is that the, even the distinction between science and metaphysics is a fairly modern kind of distinction. If, if you take Isaac Newton, he described what he was doing as natural philosophy. Right. And there wasn't any sharp distinction between the metaphysical questions and the scientific questions. Right. There was just theorizing about the structure of the world. And then what's right. happened is that, you know, things have become very specialized. And then there are some people who, you know, learn experimental methods. There are some people that learn, you know, mathematical techniques. And then there are some people that are a little bit more concerned with larger questions about the world that don't require too much experimentation by themselves to think about or too much high-powered mathematics to think about. And the people that are doing that often call themselves <laughs> metaphysics, metaphysicians. So you're really asking a, what those people might have to say about uh, okay, general so questions about the structure of the world. I think one thing that historically they've been useful in doing is looking at the interface between ordinary ways of thinking and then the scientific image. Uh, mm. So we, some people call the ordinary way of thinking the manifest image and the, let's call the other one the scientific image, you know. So just to take an example, you know, we, we talk and think about colors and then there's a scientific description of the surfaces of objects, and then it's not altogether clear how to relate the one way of thinking and talking to the scientific way of thinking and talking. Does the scientific way indicate there's something wrong, or are we just describing the same thing in two different ways, or is science leaving something out, mm. and so on and so on. So that's one style of inquiry where uh, philosophers uh, have been uh, so, very so, useful. To so, so, so to use that example, and to look at it from the two extremes, let's say this. So looking at color. So the one extreme would say that the real thing is the scientific description of the wavelengths of the electromagnetism. And the construct, the artificial contingent accident of evolution, is because we were selected for because of certain ways that we could uh, appreciate those colors. So those colors, what we feel is, 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 is artificial, the real things are the wavelengths, but it just works out that way. The exact opposite would be to say that the reality of the world is the phenomenology, the feeling of seeing those colors. That's something baked into the, the, the reality of the world. And the scientific explanation is just the physical current manifestation of that. Yeah, so th there's quite a lot going on there. I mean, one aspect of the whole thing is the color experience, what you're calling the yeah. color phenomenology. And of course, the descriptions of the spectral reflectances and how light, you know, bounces off things or and goes through other sorts of things, depending on how opaque and so on it is. I mean, uh, that that isn't designed to describe color experience. Right. But colors on the face of it aren't the same as color experience. Right. I mean, on the face of it, uh, there are red things even when we're not looking, <laughs> as it were, and there are red things even when we're not having color experience. So what I, I was getting at was what's the relationship between the redness of the English letterbox mm -hmm. and the uh, structural features of the letterbox that the mm. scientists... And it seems, I mean, it's a bit crazy to say that the structural stuff that the science describes isn't there, isn't it? Yeah. You know, uh, philosophers don't tend to be that mad. They're not going for views like, oh, there's really just experience yeah. and there aren't letterboxes. Well, some do. But you know, some do, really but that, that seems a little bit mad. But, right. you know, I'm, I'm right. not that kind of guy. Right. So uh, so I was just using as an example, you know, we've got on the one hand the color experience. On the other hand, we've got the structural thing described by the, of the, the structural features of the pillar box, letterbox described by... Uh, the scientists, but then we've got this third thing, the color of the letterbox that we're somehow trying to fit into the picture. And you can see 
It's not immediately obvious what to say about that third thing, as it were, the color of the letterbox. And that's something that uh, historically uh, philosophers, I think, have had illuminating things to say. And another end to thing to realize is that the, the role of philosophy in uh, opening up new areas of science or ways of doing science and e even physics. I mean, back in the day, there was a, a debate between Leibniz, uh, a philosopher, you know, one of the most important uh, uh, philosophers of the early modern period, and uh, Newton, who was speaking through his mouthpiece, uh, Clark. Mm. He didn't want to interact directly <laughs> with Leibniz, where uh, Leibniz was uh, running arguments designed to show that there isn't this thing space, there are just spatial relations. So there isn't this thing, the position of things, there's just spatial relations mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And as it were, there's not another possibility where everything's just like this, but move five feet to the right. <laughs> there aren't those two distinct possibilities, yeah. one where everything's where it is, and yeah. another where everything's <laughs> moved five feet from the right. That, that, there aren't those two distinct possibilities, and then they you know, had a, an argument about this. And, you know, Leibniz's way of thinking proved to be very fertile and then got integrated into uh, the development of all sorts of physics. And I, I think you'll see time and again that, uh, as it were, some structural ideas that come from that have come from philosophers then get integrated and embellished within scientific theory. And so I like to see there being sort of a, a fluid intellectual movement between them rather than, well, there's what the metaphysicians do and then what the scientists so do. So what are some other categories of metaphysics currently, uh, questions that you work on that um, can illuminate uh, the, the world as it exists today or might be, uh, helps the scientists of the future? I think, uh, you know, the, the, the metaphysics of mind is a place where actually scientists kind of are doing amateur philosophy quite a lot. Okay. They sort of feel, well, we've done our science and so we're gonna like have amateur philosophy yeah. hour, <laughs> where we're just gonna say all sorts of speculative things about free will and consciousness, and then say very speculative things about that, and how that might be integrated in, into some grand final theory of neurobiology or even ultimate physics. And I think uh, philosophers uh, are pretty well placed to think with a lot of care about those topics and at, surprisingly to lend a little bit of discipline to the sort of theorizing that goes on uh, within scientists at that end of things. So I think certainly uh, big questions about consciousness, free will, and other categories in the metaphysics of mind, including artificial intelligence and whatnot. I, it seems to me that philosophers are, are well equipped to discipline uh, our thinking about uh, yeah. topics like and that. And many neuroscientists, of course, would say that the uh, f philosophical intervention in those subjects is at, at best a waste of time. And, uh, and most likely uh, a, uh, uh, an annoyance and, an, and a, uh, an obstacle to progress. Yes, but... Uh, because the only I mean, answer... I might say that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 history, the, the history of thinking on these topics doesn't encourage that view. I mean, the history of thinking on these topics has been shaped by uh, philosophers. And in fact, a lot of the categories and ideas they're playing around with are in fact, uh, in, uh, in the history of ideas, uh, have, a, uh, uh, have been shaped by philosophers. So it's, it's a little strange to start playing with, with, playing with uh, ideas that are the product of philosophical thinking and then say, well, I, I don't care about <laughs> philosophy. It doesn't seem like a very promising point of view. Also, uh, I mean, it's, it's not as if either that the, the speculative end of these disciplines, when they start to speculate about consciousness and free will, are, are particularly, you know, uh, informed by empirical stuff. Often, if you actually look at what they're doing, they're not doing stuff that they're particularly well uh, placed to do. Often, a lot of the ideas and arguments are things that can be appraised without knowing uh, 
every single one of the details of neurobiology that they happen to also have some expertise in. That's not to say there are certain points where uh, there might be some really interesting interface between the actual details of the physics mm -hmm. and uh, some ideas about uh, free will and consciousness and so on, but it doesn't always go that way.